Welcome back. So this is going to be the last part of chapter three. And I'm going to go and talk about the membrane in a little bit more detail and then talk about transport, how we move things in and out of the cell. So this will be a little bit of a review, but remember the cell membrane has a major function. It provides protection. All right, so it can protect your insides from the outside. It keeps all your internal components where they need to be. It's going to control the content of the cytoplasm. So it's going to regulate the different ions and proteins that are going to be coming in and out of the cell. It's going to sense molecules and other cells in the environment. So cells do have to communicate with each other. They need to have to have a way to say, hey, I'm this type of cell. This is the connection point where we're going to attach. And it's all done through the plasma membrane via the proteins, glycolipids, glycocarbs. There's all kinds of different things. But major cell membrane contains homeostasis. So by how it does that, it's selectively permeable. So it regulates what goes in and out. Now I've used, I mentioned the fluid mosaic. I want you to appreciate the membrane. It's not rigid. It's kind of like if you were to put like a swimming pool and you poured a bunch of ping pong balls in it, you would see like the balls kind of move with the waves and the water. Your membrane's kind of like that. So let's go a little bit more detail, but let's refresh our brain about what a phospholipid was. So remember a phospholipid, it's a very unique structure. It's amphipathic, which is a cool word. So basically that means it has a water loving head which is that phosphate and glycerol, and then those water-hating tails, so hydrophilic head, hydrophobic tails. Now, what happens is when you put a bunch of these phospholipids in together, what they're going to do is they're spontaneously going to arrange and form this bilayer. Now, the reason it does that is it wants to make sure everyone that hates water is in the same area. Because remember, your body is made up mostly water. You're going to have a um, exterior, extracellular, and intracellular components are mostly uh, going to be water. But we need to make sure all these tails are away from it. So they go through and they face inward. Now, it's very important because of as I mentioned, it's going to control what goes in and out of the cell. So you have the water loving on the outside and the inside, and the water fearing in the middle. Now, depending on the type of molecule you are, you might be able to easily go through the membrane or not. So just a reminder, your nonpolar ones, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, your hydrocarbons, they can go through both types of environment. They love water, and they can actually go through this water fearing part. So they're able to easily pass, boom, 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 and pass through. Now, if you are hydrophilic, you could be over here. You could be over here, but you don't want to be here. They hate you. If you're a hydrophilic molecule, these little tails want nothing to do with you. So in order to get in and out of the cell, you're going to need some help. So this is where we have these proteins, these channels. And what they do is they act like a little shipping channel to move your hydrophilic molecules in and out of the cell. Uh, there's different things that proteins can do. They can in include with signaling, structure, and support, how cells interact with each other. But these proteins are going to be super important for helping move things in and out of the cell, too. So just a um, refresher about these proteins. So if you remember the uh, individual monomer of a protein was an amino acid. And it's about the major components. You have the amine group, carboxyl group, central carbon. But it was this R group right here, this side chain, that gave it some unique flavor. Now, this little R group made some of them hydrophobic and then some of them hydrophilic. So if you are amino acid that uh, are polar or nonpolar, if you have an amino acid that has hydrophobic um, qualities, you're going to be able to fold into that protein in the area that's going to span on the inter interior of the plasma membrane. So this diagram can look kind of confusing. So the E is the exterior of the cell, P is the phospholipid, so the no water zone, and then the I is the interior cell. So a lot of proteins, when they're just chains of amino acids, just we're calling it, here's a long chain that's folded into a certain way. If it's going to be embedded in a plasma membrane, 
it's going to have to have parts that can like water and parts that hate water. So the parts of the protein that are going to be on the inside part in the no water zone have to have the side chains that can handle this type of environment. The, type, the parts of the protein that are on the extracellular or intracellular part have to have the side chain with the side groups that love water. So how the order of a protein and the order of amino acids is important because it determine if it can actually insert into the membrane so it's going to do its job. Now I mentioned the term fluid mosaic model and this is a really cool video. I advise you to watch it. It just sums up the plasma membrane. It's great. But we've had experiments to kind of help prove that the phospholipids are not exactly stuck to each other. Even the proteins, they move around. It's not a static structure. So what was done, it's a really cool experiment. Since we use the same type of phospholipids, they took two different types of cells. They took a mouse cell and then a human cell. Now we have specific proteins within our membranes between the two different ones. So what they do is they took a fluorescent tag and they labeled the mouse cells with the red fluorescent tag, all the proteins on it. And then for the human cell, they took their fluoresc their proteins and laid them, labeled them with the blue fluorescent tag. Now what they do next is they fuse the two cells. So they kind of whoosh them into one. So when it starts at first, all the mouse proteins will be on one side, human on the other. Now if you let it sit there for a while, what you start to see is all these proteins embedded within the membrane start to become intermixed, supporting the fact that it's not static, it's constantly moving around. Which kind of leads us to transport a little bit. So we got to get things in and out of the cell. So you might have had lunch or about two or breakfast, but and now it's going through the process of digestion. And once we get to your small intestine, we need to absorb the smaller nutrients, those macromolecules, and then transport them to all the different types of cells in your body. So, you know, some of my brain cells probably need some some carbohydrates so they can go to undergo cellular respiration. So, what's going to happen in your small intestine? You have all these little microvilli that provide a huge surface area. All of those macromolecules that are absorbed, your fats and proteins and all that stuff, will be absorbed and then transported and eventually flow into the blood supply. And once it gets into the blood supply, it will go through and go through all the different types of cells and then the cells will intake what they need to. So I'm going to introduce a few things. First off is the term diffusion. So if you remember the plasma membrane, boom, 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 right it's differently permeable so it's going to be very selective on what can cross and what can't. Now diffusion is just the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration so you hear that term concentration gradient come up quite often. So if you look at this you see here's our starting point right here it's very crowded right here and on the other side not very crowded. So these types of molecules right here they're able to easily pass through them. So maybe it's oxygen molecules right here, or carbon dioxide. So we have all these we'll call them oxygen. It's really crowded over here, not so much over here. So I don't know about you, but I like to have space. I hate being in super crowded areas. Um, pandemic's great for me um, because, you know, we, space, give me my space bubble. Now, these little oxygen molecules want their space bubbles. So what they're going to do is some of them are going to diffuse or pass through that plasma membrane to where there's no space over here. So what they're doing is going down a concentration gradient. So the concentration is higher here and it's going to where there's a lower concentration. Now what's going to happen is it's going to keep going until it's equal on both sides. This is also known as passive transports because it's just going to E happen on its own. Now sometimes you need help. So that term facilitated diffusion happens right here. So those hydrophilic molecules are just water molecules in general. We need to get them across that plasma membrane. These are where those protein channels help. So they might serve as like a little shipping channel to move molecules across. Um, sometimes it might be a little called carrier proteins where it goes in and binds and then it changes shapes and releases on the other side. 
The key thing is these are open and you don't have to have an input of energy. Just like before, go back one, there's no input of energy right here. Now another term you might have heard before is osmosis. So we're still going down the concentration gradient. We're going from where it's super concentrated to low, but we're only talking about the movement of water only. So not the particles, just the water. So your cell's gonna use these little ch um, channels called aquaporins, proteins, to help you move water across your membrane. So this experiment right here, I'll kind of walk you through it. So the little purple balls are solute, and the water is shown in pink. So in right here, we have this little dotted line. It's a semi-permeable membrane. It's got like little holes in it. Depending on the size of your molecule, it will determine if you can pass or not. So on this diagram right here, the purple balls are too big to go across right here. So we're able to put two different concentrations. So if you look at the concentration of purple balls here, it's a lot higher than this side. But if you compare the concentration of water, the water is more concentrated on this side. You have more water molecules compared to on this side. So water is always going to go from a higher concentration to low. So if you started it off right here and gave it time, what you're going to see, the water molecules, hey, I want more space, they're going to move across the membrane because they're small enough and spread out more here so they have more area that they can overtake. You still have the same number of purple balls on both sides, but the water is what that moved. So the book talks a little bit about osmotic pressures. So we move things in and out of the cells, and we have these terms hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. So if you've ever seen, as I mentioned, you know, like when your plant shrivels and when you haven't watered it, um, what happens is all the water left the cell kind of gets kind of small and plasmalized. That's a good hypertonic one. An isotonic is where you have equal going in, equal going out. You really have no net movement. Everything's equal. Cells are going to be in no status quo. Um, and a hypotonic, so if I was going to put something in a hypotonic solution, What's going to happen is the concentration is different, so the water is going to go into the cell. And what that happens is it causes it to swell. So it all talks about what you're putting the solute concentration in. And one experiment that we would have done if we were face-to-face -face is we would have took our little Elodia plant, and then what you would have done is you would have put salt water on it. Now, the salt water would have caused the cell to say I'm in a hypertonic solution. There's more, um, there's not as many water molecules outside the cell as the inside the cell. So the water molecules would have left and you would have saw the plasma membrane pulled away and kind of, these cells kind of look like shriveled appearance. So we've been talking going down the concentration gradient. But what if you want to go against it? So these are these people that love to go to like concerts and be like right up against the stage and be like crowded with lots of people. This is this is the category right here. So active transport. When you're talking about active transport, we're going to have to use energy to go from low concentration to high. So we're going to where it's more crowded. They want to be that way. If you ever think about how much effort does it take to walk in a crowded area, you're bumping people, probably pushing them out of the way and all that other stuff, it takes a lot more energy versus when you just kind of spread out and get your own space. So with this one, we're going against the concentration gradient. Now to do this, we're going to have to use proteins, and we're going to use our molecule ATP to do that. So this is an example of a sodium-potassium pump where it shows that we're taking the little sodium molecules, and they want to go to here, and they want to be work. They want to be together. They don't want their individual space bubbles. So what's going to happen is they're going to be loaded into this pump right here, and ATP molecule is going to come, give them a little packet of energy, and what causes that little protein to change shape. So it's going to close on this end and then open up, and the sodium leaves. When that happens, potassium is going to like, hey, there's my opening, you know, elevator door open, and it's going to load. Another AT, the ADP molecule is going to unload another phosphate and confirmation change again. So let's compare them. 
passive transport versus active transport. So passive, you're going down the concentration gradient from where it's high to low. And you're going to keep going until everyone has the same amount of space. So it can happen in two different ways. There's diffusion where you don't you can go through the membrane quite easily, depending on the type of molecule you are. Or if you need help, that's called facilitated diffusion. So passive transport down the concentration gradient from where it's more concentrated to where it's less does not require energy. Versus active transport. You want to go where it's crowded, and you know it's going to take a lot of effort. So you have to use a protein, and you have to use an energy molecule to get across. So you have to pay. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost ATP. So you want to go from here, where all your friends are, where it's super crowded. Now, as I mentioned, these two are GIFs. Um, if I have it saved as a PDF file for when I do my stuff in. Ultra. So if you go to the Amoeba Sisters, you can actually see these Amoeba's gifts are really cool. And there's a lot of other ones too. There's a lot of cool ones for all the cell organelles. So I want to wrap it up with vesicular traffic. You know, how do we get stuff in and out of cell? What if you're too big to use a protein channel? So we talked about vesicles and how they're like the little shipping packages throughout the cell. But if you're too big to use the membrane um, channel proteins or your molecule that's being engulfed, about to be eaten, you will probably be using this method right here. So what's going to happen is we're going to either take in or get rid of what we need. Now, if it's going to be leaving, it's going to be called exocytosis. So what we're going to do is we're going to take whatever we made, put it in a vesicle, and that vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane. And then it's going to be released. So exocytosis, exiting the cell. Versus endocytosis means the cell is taking you in. So maybe this is that little bacterium and he's going to eat him for food. So he kind of engulfs him, puts him in a vesicle, shifts him to the lysozyme. So here are some review videos if you're kind of still haven't confused on that. But that's going to wrap up chapter three.